Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. I'm joined again today by campaigner, academic and author Dr. Nick Collistrom, talking yet again about the London bombings of July the 7th, 2005, in which 56 people lost their lives in the biggest mass murder on UK soil since the Second World War. For those who aren't aware, this atrocity was not carried out by Islamic extremists, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban or any other group of men with brown skin and long beards, because there isn't a shred of evidence which points to this. If you know of any, please let us know. All the evidence points to a false flag operation in which security services were involved in killing the people they are supposed to protect. If you don't believe this, go to the Rich Planet website, click on the top left hand corner, 7-7 seven, seven shows, where you can catch up on hours and hours of analysis of the evidence which backs up what I'm saying. But today we are not here to discuss the evidence, uh, Nick. We're here to discuss political responses to our assertions. But before we do that, let's just summarise briefly the key holes in the official story, Nick. Well, Richard, uh, there are a few what you might call very in-your-face in discrepancies that might be worth mentioning in a very short time if you get a, a surgery interview with your a MP. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the Edgware Road coach had three large holes in the bottom that was shown by the inquest with people getting trapped in those holes and, uh, and horrific scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those three large holes are very graphically incompatible with the idea of a single terrorist uh, bomber and, and uh, the holes were not actually anywhere near where they tried to place this, this okay. terrorist. But that's an example of a very graphic uh, discrepancy that, uh, that, uh, and uh, let me give you wha one more Richard that the, uh, the location where the bodies were all taken to and stored after the catastrophe of London bombings, the set up by the Royal Artillery Company in Old Street. It was set up on July the 6th, that's the day before. It was a military company, uh, had a com contract uh, and it got all ready and it got stuff at Tavistock Square ready to collect the bodies uh, and refrigerate them and take them over. So uh, that is important to understand that cause and effect, one comes before, cause comes before the effect, get the time sequence right. Um, for example, when the 9-11 events happened, you got the huge FEMA uh, lorries turning up mm -hmm. to clear up the ground zero, and they turn up the day before on, on Monday evening. So that kind of thing where the time sequence is the wrong way around, I think especially these days everyone watched the film The, the, the Matrix and, and sees this as a sign of the, the fabricated reality that we're living in. Uh, when the, the, how, the, uh, the ha housing for maintaining and keeping the dead bodies after the London bombing set up on the 6th of July, the contracts awarded and they started up, that's an indication that uh, it's a fabricated event and uh, that, that's the kind of things that are, are, are very direct and, and evident. Uh, we could say another one Richard, mm -hmm. uh, as you're well aware, that uh, there were no post-mortems on the bodies. Yeah, not a single post-mortem, 56 people dead yeah. in some massive atrocity yeah. and they don't do a single post-mortem. Yeah. So we got at the inquest, we got this uh, aghast uh, and, and stupefied victim families who had to, often had to wait about a week before they got their remains of their loved ones back again, uh, having to cope with the idea of no post-mortems. Uh, and, and what was going on here? Uh, they were just treated as bodies to be labelled. Was there some funny business? Uh, what, what was, well, did you, they I think you suspect that post-mortems would have revealed the true uh, cause of the deaths, i.e. through some sort of either military type explosives or some perhaps even other more sophisticated device exactly uh, yes. which was not yeah. what we were told yeah. in the narrative that they had what uh, yeah. hydrogen peroxide or whatever it yeah. was yeah yeah so richard I, I i suggest we need to try and focus on these very I I in your face discrepancies and impossibilities in, in the story mm -hmm. that can be put across quite quite briefly because uh th th they try to dismiss anything as conspiracy theory that uh that they can't explain. Right. Um, 
for example, uh, the, the BBC is famous reporting of the 9-11 the when the seventh tower fell down. The BBC was reporting it beforehand and they tried to say, oh, w w when this came up and people mm -hmm. asked the BBC, oh, what's going on? They said, oh, we're not really into conspiracy theory, sorry. Um, well, w w we're not interested in their views on conspiracy theory. We just want to know why they reported the event before it happened. Yeah. Uh, and the time sequence being out of joint like that it is, I think, good evidence for uh, um, this thing being a cooked up job. And of course, people can go to my website, richplanet.net, and Nick's website, which is terrorontheTube.co.uk, to look in more detail at all of this evidence, which pulls huge holes in the official story. So, so you suspect that intelligence agencies were involved, in particular Mossad and perhaps MI5. Can you expand uh, on that? Absolutely, yes, Richard. Uh, my book might have underestimated the, the role of, of is Israeli Mossad in involvement here. I, I, I don't highlight that at all. Um, I, I talk about FBI, CIA involvement, but uh, the fact is within about two hours of the event in Israel, on the Jerusalem Post website, they went up an article, Rules for Waging a Third World War, by uh, uh, Ephraim Levi, and it, it was all about the bombings, and it knew too much about them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it had obviously been composed beforehand. Right. And it's, uh, the phrase actually printed was, yesterday's bombings show all the hallmark of, uh, as if the article was expecting to go into the, uh, the, the next day's right. newspaper or something. Um, but but uh, 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 and, and it knew too much about the locations uh, and the proximity of the right. world, where the World Zionist Conference was arranged to Tavistock Square. And uh, w once again, if, some, if an article like that has obviously been written before, that does tell you a lot about the arrangement of, of the event. Right. You know? So w did it go out the same day as uh, and the just, just, just to add, that is obviously not unconnected with Benjamin Netanyahu mm -hmm. being in London for, to give a, a lecture at a conference, uh, at Israeli trade conference, and then being warned not to go uh, six minutes before it happened. Not to go out of his hotel room. Y yeah, he tried to obfuscate that, but there were various reports about it. Uh, it's quite clear that there was some advanced intelligence, uh, uh, Israeli intelligence, that things were going to happen. So just to go back to the internet article that you're talking about, Nick, are you saying that that was published on the same day as the London bombings? Absolutely, yeah. And it said, yet, and it, and it said yesterday's bombing, so they put it out a day too early, is that what? Uh, that, uh, that is the, the inference, yeah. Yesterday's bombings, and so on and so on, that, that was uh, the afternoon of July the 7th in, uh, in the Jerusalem Post website, uh, right. not in the published newspaper, within a few hours, and they took it down a week later because everyone was complaining. Alex Jones was saying, hey look, these guys knew too much. Right. Uh, what's going on here? All right. So, for those who are new to the concept of false flag terrorism, Nick, what would be the reason why various agencies such as Mossad or MI5 or CIA would plan such an atrocity on their own people? Well, it's the whole concept of the unfolding new world order uh, as shown in uh, for example, the American uh, project from the New American Century, whereby if you've got 800 American bases all around planet Earth, you have to explain what they're doing there. Uh, and you haven't got the communist menace anymore. You've got to have them defending the civilized world against something. You can't say, we're here to plunder your resources mm. uh, and, and take all your raw materials. Um, uh, and, and so you've got the, the new meme for the 21st century of, of the war on terror, as, as if terror was something you could fight a war against. And that had to be taken to Europe mm -hmm. after 9-11. Uh, and so it arrived in Madrid, and then it arrived in London. And uh, then the very next day uh, after it happened, uh, the decision was made, uh, I think the next day, for, for Britain to get the uh, uh, Olympics. Right. Um, so it was like some deal was made, horrible deal was made. Right. That, that Paris had halfway built the Olympics. They thought they were going to get it, mm -hmm. and then suddenly, zoom, London gets it. Right. So it's a bit as if that that, that deal was made. But uh, ba basically, it was the meeting of Blair and Bush at Glen Eagles, uh, and uh, Bush could not possibly have survived a week with uh, those those world leader politicians at. Glen Eagles in Scotland at the G8 summit because he, he can't talk real politics, he couldn't talk, mm. you know, he, he can just do, we are fighting the war on terror, we will not give in, we will walk tall, and Blair and Bush did that, and, uh, and that was what the London bombings enabled them to do, that, that's why I had to synchronise with that Glen right. Eagles event. Okay, now I've looked fairly closely over the last 
three or four years or so at the evidence of the London bombings and I'm convinced uh, that what you assert in your book is true and so I wanted to do, s to do something about this and in 2012, September 2012, I went to my MP and I gave him six documents. I'm just going to list what I gave him. There's a, and they're all available from richplanet.net if you want to download them and read them or print them out or take them to your own MP. Uh, there's a covering letter in there. There's a list of internet films and TV programs about 7-7. There's uh, a document called Theorizing Truth by Dr. Rory Ridley Duff and that goes into the events at uh, Canary Wharf on the day of 7-7 where we suspect the Patsies uh, were probably murdered by some covert group uh, and there's evidence of that in news reports. Um, also a report by Principal Police Intelligence Analyst Tony Farrell. I also included um, a letter that uh, Nick wrote to Lady Justice Hallett before the inquest and also a summary of um, Nick's book Terror on the Tube. Uh, I also gave my MP a copy of Nick's book and a copy of 7-7 Seven Seven Ripple Effect. So I was encouraging other people to do the same, to print these documents out and take them to their MPs. And I've had around about 100 people have done this, and we've got 38 replies so far from MPs in writing or verbally to their constituents. And we're going to have a look at some of them today, uh, Nick. Uh, now I've split them up into four or five different categories. I've referred to the first category as a blind rebuttal, which is a complete sort of, I'm not even going to look at this evidence because it's such a crazy suggestion. Uh, there's a rebuttal with comments where the MP is actually saying, well, I don't agree with this, and then they've given the reason why. Uh, there's non-committal uh, re responses where they don't s suggest either way whether they're supporting the suggestions. Uh, there's a referral, which is where an MP has given the documents or passed them on to somebody else, and it's either been the Security Minister, James Brokenshire, or the Home Secretary, and the ones that have been sent to the Home Secretary seem to have been passed on to James Brokenshire, and we've got a number of replies from James Brokenshire, that's the Security Minister, we're going to talk about him mm -hmm. uh, a little bit later. Uh, one went to the BBC, the Director General of the BBC, and we've got a response from that, and another one, this was the letter sent to Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown's office sent it to the head of Counterterrorism Command, and we've got a response from them as well, which we're going to talk about. Uh, and the next section of responses were MPs that have shown some kind of positive attitude towards helping us get the truth out about 7-7. Mm. And mm. my strategy is, and by the time this interview goes out, I will have done this, I'm going to contact the constituents that got positive replies from their MPs, ask them to contact them again and inform them of who the other MPs are that are positive on it and see if we can create a little group of MPs within Parliament who can then perhaps campaign on our behalf within Parliament. That's yeah. kind of my thinking on this. Um, but what were the highlights um, for you, Nick? And incidentally, you can read all of these MPs' letters in response to, um, to the documents from richplanet.net. Yeah. Well, first of all, Richard, I feel we need to avoid putting an MP in a possible situation where, where that would end their career. Uh, I think uh, agreeing with this thesis we're putting forward is as such fairly impossible for, for a, or well, I suspect it may be impossible for mm. a, a, a MP. Okay. Uh, I feel we want to support and encourage the, the good MPs, and to my way of thinking, the good MPs are those who are not members of any Freemason Association, who are not friends of Israel, and who vote against the war. Um, so just to interrupt you, uh, Nick, that's an actual organisation called Friends of Israel, which Friends of Israel, MPs yeah. can sign uh, up to. Eighty uh, percent of Conservative MPs are Friends of Israel. Really? Uh, and and, and uh, th this is a, a very shocking grip, which uh, or influence, which uh, uh, I think Israel has upon um, mm -hmm. British policy making now. Uh, and, and we want to encourage, find out that those MPs who are who are not thus affiliated, because. I think such affiliations, they lose the independence mm -hmm. of judgment and they lose the loyalty of serving England or Britain first. That's what the MB should be, should be there for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 okay, so let's have a look at one or two of these replies, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, an excellent one by Tim Farron MP, a Liberal Democrat, and he writes, um, he, he's uh, thankful for being asked about uh, so many unexpected loose ends in recent events of national significance. And he then says uh, he will look at the information as being so crucial to a full understanding of the threat to democracy from so many rich and self-interested people. 
Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's a, a, a terribly valuable comment to have. Uh, and he's going about as far as he can in he saying that it looks like there might be something in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And he's the MP for Westmoreland and Lonsdale. OK, well, let's stick on the positive ones. We'll go through those ones first. Um, this is just um, something from uh, the, from, is it Sean James or Sian James from uh -huh. Swansea East? Um, apparently said she would take up the matter with the Secretary of State, so that's really a referral to the Secretary of State. So right. um, uh, a constituent contacted uh, Labour MP Alan Campbell and said that he was good and kind, he listened to everything, then asked a few questions himself, which I could easily answer, mm. given the amount of research, especially about 7-7. I thought he was genuinely interested, he was especially bowled over by Farrell's table of evidence. Oh, right. uh, he could not explain it away and actually held up his hands. Uh, I was supposed to be there for an hour, but was there for an hour and 40 minutes. He is really approachable uh, and turns out to have a great sense of humour too. Yeah. Uh, he said he will ring me on Monday. So, so, that, so that's uh, Time Mouth Labour MP Alan Campbell. Yes, could we just add here that Tony Farrell did an excellent analysis of the events in the, in the way that he was trained to do as a uh, statistical an, an, an analyst, senior intelligence analyst mm. for South Yorkshire Police. And, and he looked, uh, gave probabilities to the various claims that were made uh, of, of the uh, London bombings and evaluated which is the more likely story. So um, I, I'm but glad to see that impress your, this MP. Right, OK, well, we'll come on to another positive one, Nick, which is from um, MP Charles Henry. Did you know that one? This yeah, is uh, MP Henry. for Wheeldon. Have you got right. that one there? Yes. Um, I'll just read it out. Thank you for your letter dated the 1st of November regarding your concerns about the London bombings. I am grateful to you for taking the time to write to me about this matter and to include your own research about this. Please be assured I will read the documents with great care. Right. So that's fairly positive. And Frank Doran, Aberdeen North. Um, Please accept my apologies for not responding to you before now. I note the points you make in relation to 7-7 and the war in Iraq. I didn't see the programme you referred to, but I am obviously familiar with both issues. I am probably not the best person to ask in relation to the Iraq war. When I had the opportunity I've, I, to vote, I voted against my own government and opposed the war. There is nothing in subsequent events which has changed my mind. Um, do you know if the vote for the war was after or before the bombings, Nick? Um. Well, I think it was before. Before, okay. Yeah. So, he, yeah. so this MP presumably is then saying that that the London bombings didn't change his mind about whether the war was right or not. So, yes. Yes. you can maybe read that into this yeah. into this response, okay? Um, any other notable ones? Um, well, I thought Meg Munn from Sheffield was uh, w was one of the most important. Um, now she's she's in my rebuttal with comments category, so she's rebutted the claims, yeah. Yeah. Um, so do you care to fill us in on that? Well, she first of all um, uh, took notice of Tony Farrell's uh, uh, scale of probability for, for assessing the events, though she thinks it was subjective, um, uh, uh, and uh, she doesn't think that this proves the inside job hypothesis, um, uh, and uh, then. Uh, she alluded to my book, but but says that it uh, drew on coincidences and obscures actual events. Um, so, so she she wasn't uh, um, convinced. Then she of uh, Rory Ridley Duff theorising truth. Um, she says it uses probability and coincidence. Um, so she's look, She has looked at the documents clearly. Yeah. And she's saying she doesn't agree that there's anything in them. That's essentially what she's she's saying. Y yeah. Uh, she, she says that um, a serious incidents often attract conspiracy theories which don't stand up to analysis uh, and, uh, uh, and then she re recommends this type of crap book Voodoo Histories uh, by, by um, David Aronovich yeah. um, who was which, an um, arch debunker and skeptic. yeah so anyone who likes that must have thought processes like a flea flittering around the head you know <laughs> it's just totally <laughs> inconsequential um, <laughs> yeah she says it is common for a series of instances oh sorry you've already read that bit um, I, may I, if I may suggest to you some further reading on this I would recommend Voodoo Histories uh, the role of conspiracy the role of the conspiracy theory in shaping modern history yeah okay <laughs> so uh, she has bothered to answer um, she has focused her mind on the subject, uh, and, and uh, so I think it's I think it's worthwhile. You've got this reply. Let me okay. just say that. All right, then. Well, let, let's look at some other categories then. Um, 
Uh, and uh, well, hang on. Uh, the important thing yes. I want is, is a Andrew George. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's. Uh, well, but but he he uh, then approaches the BBC. Yes. Uh, okay. So, people. so this is the f this is one of the referral ones. We'll come to this one now. All right. Then. Yeah. Uh, so. Most of the MPs that referred it on, as I said, got referred to the security minister or the home secretary. This one, this guy, decides to refer it to the director general of the BBC. Right, I've got the BBC's response here. Uh, we're going to go for a short break now, Nick, and we're going to look at this BBC document after this. Welcome back. I'm talking to Nick Collestrom about MPs' responses to our assertions that the London bombings were an inside job. Now, one of the MPs sent uh, these documents to the BBC, and we got, yeah. we've got a response from the BBC from the highest level, it seems. Well, if we could first just focus on what Andrew George says, okay. because it's, I think it's really encouraging when you get a reply from an MP about how they're keeping an open mind on this subject, because that's what we want. We want open minds prepared to look at the evidence. Um, uh, so this MP is in, in Penzance, uh, and this was delivered, uh, and uh, it, it, he asked, was it, uh, with the, was it carried out involving the connivance of the BBC, British oil authorities, and intelligence, and Mossad? That, mm -hmm. That's, he starts off asking, that is the question, okay? That is, which, uh, kind of paradoxically, it will be quite impossible for any British MP, as such, to acknowledge that. It's the nature of fabricated terror, let's just remind ourselves that, of this, that everything is risked. The truth cannot come out without the state disintegrating. The mm -hmm. integrity of the state is rests upon this lie. That is the terrible ultimate issue which is at stake, okay? So what does the MP uh, reply? Um, he says, as with other conspiracies, uh, you might draw my attention, I have kept an open mind to the possibility that such claims may, or indeed uh, may not, be soundly based. And then he says, he'd written to the controller of the BBC, who would not have been in charge of the BBC at the time of the 77 bombings, so implying that he's uh, I impartial, uh, and also with James Brokenshire in the Home Office, um, uh, actions of security services at that time. So he says, uh, I don't necessarily immediately accept your claims, but keep an open mind to their possibility. So I think, I think that's a very good reply, uh, uh, which then encloses a letter from the BBC. So let's look at this BBC reply. Um, what do you want to say about it? Well, uh, because you were in the BBC's programme uh, conspiracy absolutely. files, yeah? Yeah. So he shares, he shares the letter with Mike Rudin, who was series producer of the conspiracy files, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Mike Rudin is a real liar from hell, uh, and, and he will uh, compromise the people working with him uh, and, and absolutely lie to them. That's what they did with me, as a condition of getting me onto that program uh, and of interviewing me and cutting out absolutely everything, all the hours of intelligent dialogue we had, and just trapping me into a situation where, where I looked ridiculous, uh, breaking all the solemn assurances and promises that they'd given to me, whereby I came onto that BBC programme in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Mike Rudin then gi gives some comments uh, about uh, whether whether conspiracy uh, whether conspiracy programmes are of, are of value and why he thinks the um, why he thinks the inquest story uh, is is okay, and also why he doesn't. Um, uh, so why they dismiss my view of the mm -hmm. program. I mean, I'd just like to point out at, at this stage, Nick, that for, for viewers who are maybe scratching their heads a bit, there has been no court which has probably evaluated any of the evidence of 7-7, yeah? No the, court, we, right, we, we've right. got the We've yeah. got the inquest with Hallett. There have been several rather strange hearings in which uh, citizens gave evidence and testified uh, as if they assumed or believed that somebody would evaluate their evidence, mm -hmm. you know, to make the people in London feel that they've been listened to. That, that, that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. MPs that have sent uh, their constituents' concerns to government have ended up with this guy, James Brokenshire, who's the security minister. And all he's done is referred the MPs and the constituents to the, the, the inquest, mm -hmm. the transcript of the inquest. Mm -hmm. Now just tell us why that's flawed. 
the, the well, inquest let itself. Let Justice Hallett concluded that um, there had been unlawful killing, a, vers a, vers a verdict of unlawful killing, mm. which um, uh, was kind of fa fairly fatuous comment. Uh, and and uh, she couldn't do the one thing that an inquest is supposed to do, namely ascertain the cause of death. Uh, so what was it all about if she couldn't ascertain that because there hadn't been no post-mortems? Uh, and uh, she was basically just there to accept and, and uh, reaffirm that everything had been as the government said it had been. So, so before any evidence had been given, the, the inquest is assuming that these four men actually carried out the bombings. Is that true to say? Yes, that the whole framework was without that being assumed or questioned. And families of those four were obviously not allowed to participate in the event at all. So she says here, the coroner concluded in paragraph 7, page 2 of her Rule 43 report that I can say without a shadow of a doubt that the four men who detonated the bombs and therefore murdered 52 innocent people were Muhammad Sadiq Khan, Shazad Tanweer, Jermaine Lindsay and Haseeb Hussain. So how can she say that without a shadow of a doubt they did it when no evidence has been presented in a proper court environment where you've got defence and prosecution examining, cross-examining witnesses, etc. Exactly. How, how can she make that statement, Nick? Exactly. All the evidence given was in a format. You just had a smarmy lawyer saying, well, thank you, you know. Uh, OK, right, let's move on. Next one, please. Mm -hmm. um, th 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 there was... Uh, so the inquest th was not to test the, the guilt of the no, people who have been alleged to do it. I'll give you an example. 18 Alexandra Grove, so-called bomb factory, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they're supposed to be loading up their car the night before, on the, on the 6th or early in the morning of July the 7th, and the lady who said she was uh, opposite testified to all four of them getting into a car. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh yeah, so them what? Yeah, yeah, so uh, Now, they can't possibly have been all four because Jermaine Lindsay uh, joined them at Aylesbury, right? Right. So the, um, the, the uh, inquest tried to get her to change the story. Are you quite sure it's four? Yes, yes, I thought four. Uh, and they couldn't get a change story. So her testimony wrecked their um, narrative because right. it was quite obviously impossible and untruthful, having four people in a car uh, setting off that early morning. Uh, the, the four, the four. But there was no, um, there was no lawyer for the defence uh, to point that out. Mm -hmm. That was just left to, um, um, left to people like you and me to point that out. Uh, and we had a weirdly docile... Uh, credulous British media who, mm -hmm. uh, uh, who, who, who do not want to question that at all, who, who will just accept anything, mm -hmm. uh, apparently, uh, of the story. Uh, now, I think what you're trying to say, Nick, is summed up by this viewer of Rich Planet who um, he sent the, the documentation to Gordon Brown, of all people, and Gordon Brown, um, to his credit, he passed it on to um, the counter terrorism people and they got a response from DCS Tom Manson okay now which is pretty lame to be honest it's on the website if you want to have a look at it but uh, this Rich Planet viewer then replied to DCS Tom Manson and in it he says can I ask you hypothetically speaking if someone has committed murder would it be acceptable for them to choose who they wanted as a judge who the prosecutor was who made up the jury what witnesses should be called and what evidence should be made available as well as being allowed to destroy the crime scene and murder weapons before the trial would you find this acceptable if it was to occur would you imagine that the accused would be found innocent um, by palming the blame onto someone else so that yeah, sums exactly, it up quite yeah, well for yeah, me that's exactly. essentially what they've done with this yeah. phony inquest yeah. okay now let's just I mean, it was a massive operation with hundreds of witnesses uh, and by the way, it's all still out there on, on, on the web. They did put it all up to, on the web for their credit. Right. Um, but there was no evaluation. Uh, I mean, there was brilliant work done by the J7 team, J7 Truth Committee, uh, putting their criteria and evaluation of the in inquest. Um, but uh, there was no trace of intelligent life from the British media as regards commenting on it. Right. Uh, I mean, I found that the, the, the weirdest thing. Right. Um, uh, and, and do the British people uh, believe it, right? Well, you might want to answer that question. Do the British people believe what they're told at the inquest? And the only way I, I found of ascertaining that was right at the end, the closure of the inquest, uh, the, the independent newspaper had a report on the closure in which Lady Justice Harriet had a slightly amusing dismissal of conspiracy theories. Uh, right. uh, and, and they're loud comments. 
Mm -hmm. So that was the only post I could see in a British newspaper where comments could be allowed about this inquest. And nearly all of them were sceptical uh, right. of what had been done at this inquest. Mm -hmm. And now you may say, well, that's not much to go on. But it's all I, I could find about whether the British media actually believe that um, mm -hmm. big four-month inquest. Okay. Well, let's look at some of these blind rebuttal as I've blind rebuttals as I have called them. Mm -hmm. The first one, and this I think this is the best one, if the best one is from, <laughs> um, this is from uh, David Jones MP. Um, quite frankly, the notion that the attacks on the London transport system in July 2005 were anything other than terrorist attacks is not only entirely divorced from reality, it is also grossly offensive to the victims and their families. Accordingly, I do not intend to take this matter further. So he's, he's saying he's not even going to look at it hmm. because the notion uh, is entirely divorced from reality. Yeah, they always play out this idea that somehow the, the survivors or, or victims, uh, relatives of the victims, uh, yeah. fa families, yeah. um, must believe the official story and it's distressing and offensive for them if you try and tell them yeah. anything else. Yeah, they'd be distressed or offended mm. if they heard my viewpoint and your viewpoint. And I'd mm. just like to say I haven't had a single person who's distressed or offended at anything that I've said about 7-7. Seven seven. Yeah. Okay, let's look well, at this well, one. Well, I, I have. The, the sister of Miriam Hyman kept harpy on this, how terribly upsetting it was. Didn't they realise, didn't they realise how terribly upsetting it was the way I, I was trying to investigate the, the alleged death of Miriam Hyman mm -hmm. on the Tavistock Square bus? Yeah. Uh, and they kept playing this card. And other people kept repeating it. Uh, oh, don't you realise what distress you're causing? Uh, and, and even the 9 Truth movement. Oh, look, why are you upsetting the relatives like this? Mm. Uh, and and uh, I was then scoffed at in the in the, in the Evening Standard report uh, that, that I was causing distress like this. Uh, I, I mean, I think we've got to have a priority of investigating what happened. You're not here to please people. No. We're here to investigate what happened. Yeah. Okay, let's look at this response. This is the Scarborough constituency and it's uh, Robert Goodwill and the constituent says, I am enclosing material which is now in public domain and which is available for you to investigate, um, blah, blah, blah. So he's asking his MP to look at the, at the documents. The MP says, MP says dear right. sir, this is the MP's reply, uh, Robert Goodwill, it's an email. Right. He says, dear sir, don't believe everything you read on the internet. I'm satisfied that these theories are unfounded. So the constituent then replies, Mr. Goodwill, so would you look at the materials provided then at all and provide a response in writing? And the MP says, no, it's all a load of rubbish. Hmm. So it's complete blind rebuttal, just not even looking at the evidence. Right. And we've got another one here from... Not, my hunch would be, Richard, that uh, if you could follow through uh, an, an interaction like that with turning up at the surgery and having a chat, eyeball to eyeball, right. uh, I, I think that would be could possibly be quite effective and worthwhile. Right, right. So they're not going to say that uh, eye to eye. I mean, that, that's what I found with my MP. He was mm. very, very receptive to what I told him. Yeah. He was quite shocked, in fact. Right. Um, so this next one, which is Chris Bryan MP, uh, he just says, the police investigated events thoroughly, and I'm afraid that I, that I do not share your analysis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let me ask you your opinion on this, Richard. Do you think there'd be a case for... Uh, putting the 9-11 event to British MPs, uh, that uh, this was fabricated terror um, made up by the intellig military intelligence, do you think they might be more accessible to that because it's less terrible, because it didn't happen here, it happened over the ocean? Uh, is it possible that MPs would be more receptive to... Right. Uh, to the right, well, I would say personally no, because they're very keen on this response where if you are not from their constituency or this is an issue which doesn't concern them then they do not want to know they don't want do not want to help you and certainly right. something which happened in America in 2001 is not their business right. so th th they're too busy um, with people who are complaining about cracks in the pavement in their constituency to bother with a huge conspiracy like 9 11 in right. fact one of the responses um, I found very interesting this was from the Durham MP let me just try and find it yeah so this is a response from Roberta Blackman Woods, MP for the City of Durham. She says, if you have contacted me about a national campaign or issue which concerns you, but you are not a constituent, I am not able to respond to you in person. Now, 
we're all familiar with that reply that if yeah, you're right. not a constituent they, yeah. they've got no responsibility for you but yeah. this one she's saying if it is if you have contacted me about a national campaign so she's saying that you're not allowed to go to your MP your own MP and tell them about a national campaign so that's a new one on me Nick and, well, and, and I, I, it might I, I, even be in response to campaigns such as this one well I think if 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 you are in there um, if they are your MP, then it's okay to go and tell them about anything that concerns you. Yeah, I would have thought so. Y yeah. But she's not. She's she's saying it's not. She's saying that if you have contacted me about a national campaign, uh, I am not able to respond to you in person. Well, it is the business of MPs to deal with na na national issues. Yeah. Um, so she only wants to deal with cracks in the pavement, by the sounds of it. Okay. Let's um, look at some other responses then, Nick. Let's go on to this. Um, Counterterrorism letter. Right. Um, yeah. Could, 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 could you perhaps clarify this idea of a minister of security, right. who you alluded to? This is a, a, a new and very bizarre idea, isn't it, of a minister of security? What does that mean? Many of the responses which went to the government ended up with um, Security Minister James Brokenshire, hmm. and he has responded by referring people to the coroner's in inquest. It says here about Brokenshire, Mr. Brokenshire led the closure of the UK's Forensic Science Service with the loss of over 2,000 jobs, which included skills forensics research scientists, many of whom who have left the profession. So the security minister is closing down the Forensic Science Unit. It's interesting. Um, can I just look at this one from Gordon Brown? Because I think there was, All right. apparently, when the constituent went to Gordon Brown with uh, their documents, um, the one of the assistants in Gordon Brown's office was promptly sacked. The constituent suspects that it was in relation to this issue. Uh, wow. the, un the other interesting thing to note is that very nice lady Rachel, who was dealing with this, has since been sacked. They wouldn't tell me why, but I can guess why. Okay. Um, so Gordon Brown's office sent the documents to um, DC Tom Manson, or sorry, the head of operational support with the Counter Terrorism Command. Mm -hmm. Now let me just. Uh, show you this diagram. This shows, this is the Met Police and we can put this on the screen. The top guy at the moment is Bernard Hogan Howe, he's the Commissioner. Below him is Assistant Commissioner uh, Cressida Dick, Special Operations, we'll come on to her. And below her is Commander Richard Walton, he's the head of SO15 uh, Counter-Terrorism Command. Mm. Now I think that group replaced Special Branch, is that right Nick? Yes, yeah, it's yes. important to appreciate, appreciate this absurd so right concept, concept of Counter-Terror counter Command. Um, uh, emerged in the wake of the London bombings uh, and uh, it replaced that the world-renowned special branch had been around for a century or so and, uh, and uh, an excellent uh, reputation for solving crime and, uh, uh, and what it, the, the counter-terror command is defined as having an enemy mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's a definition of where you're already as it were fighting a war, war against terror right. uh, and, and uh, so you're not just looking for clues uh, and ascertaining who did it, as the old special branch was. Right. Y you're, you're allegedly fighting this nonsensical war against te terror. All right. Uh, and uh, so it's an inherently rational concept at, at, at the core. Right. So one of the responsibilities of Counter Terrorism Command, as it says in Wikipedia, is to assist the British MI5 Security Service and MI6 Intelligence Service in fulfilling their statutory roles. So that kind of ties in with that, I think. Mm -hmm. So the Richard Walton of SO15, he's handed down to his subordinate to, to, to give the response to Gordon Brown's office. Detective Chief Superintendent Tom Manson, who is the deputy of Richard Walton, head of SO15 counterterrorism. Right, yeah. uh, there have been numerous conspiracy theories relating to this terrorist attack, including those referred to by your constituent. I appreciate that Mr. Such and Such is concerned about the attack and has collated a number of documents on the subject. The independent coroner's inquest was a comprehensive investigation into the bombings and the findings were made available to the public and I would invite Mr. Such and Such to view these. So again, they're just referring people to this uh, Hallett inquest. So it seems that the Hallett inquest is just being used by everyone as a means of passing off this event. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, Cressida Dick wasn't she involved with the Domenezes shooting? Absolutely. She so was be, in what, be, what is called Gold Command, right? 
uh, and this new hierarchy appear just around this time. We, the British public, hadn't really been told about well, it before. I'll just interrupt you there, Nick. We'll just interrupt you there. We'll come on to the uh after this short break. Welcome back. I'm talking to Dr. Nick Collistrom about the London bombings. Now, Nick, we've had a number of responses, MP responses, um, about the London bombings and the, the evidence that we've put forward that there was some conspiracy behind this event, that the, that the people blamed for the bombings were in fact patsies taking part in a terrorist training exercise mm. and it was probably carried out by various nefarious intelligence agencies. Now, two weeks after uh, the 7-7 bombings, uh, John Charles de Menezes gets shot in the head with six or seven bullets, uh, completely innocent guy, mm -hmm. uh, by accident. Yeah. So just, t just give us briefly the summary of the well, de Menezes. Well, uh, by accident, uh, it, it never makes sense that the stories which the police start putting out never make sense. Uh, and it's as if they're not allowed at, at liberty to tell us what, whatever the truth was or, or why he was killed or it seems they m may have mistaken him for someone else. Mm -hmm. And Cressida Dick, who was in gold command uh, in, in the, uh, this bronze, silver, gold uh, in, a, in a hierarchy that's um, uh, set up for dealing with uh, these crises, mm -hmm. uh, sh she has some clear responsibility for all this. And so she was the person who was carrying the can, if you like, for the fact that de Menezes mistakenly got shot. Yes, yes, she, she was in charge of the operation. Um, I mean, she made some cl claim that she couldn't get hear fully what was going on in, in, in the tube at the time, but uh, um, she was responsible, and she, then she got, gets promoted afterwards. So she's now Assistant Commissioner, uh, and you were telling me before the interview that, that okay. anyone who has detailed knowledge of these false flag operations... If you know something about how it was perpetrated, you're going to get promoted after the event. This especially happened in, in America with the 9-11 event of, of chief perpetrators getting promoted. And um, uh, So tell us why that is. Tell us why someone would get promoted who knows about well, what really happened. They have to keep the secrets. You, you, you can't fire them um, and leave them to sell their confessions or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they have to be kept in the system where, where they will support it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so and we see this with with Cressida Dick after this event. Um, nothing, basically, uh, um, de was shot by a, a special hit team, the Force Reconnaissance Unit or something, presumably, which seems, looks like being the same group that shot down those lads at Canary Wharf mm -hmm. at, at uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning of July the 7th. Um, and the Metropolitan Police would very much love to be able to say, look, this wasn't us, we really don't behave in this homicidal manner. Mm -hmm. uh, but they clearly weren't allowed to. In both those situations, they were not allowed to say, look, this wasn't us, this was some sort of hit team. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 and I think it was clear that the Metropolitan Police were distressed and not being allowed to say that... Uh, it had nothing to do with us. Yeah, yeah. right. All right, well, let's look at some of the other responses, Nick. We've got one from the Right Honourable Nick Clegg. Uh, which you find rather amusing. Can you just, uh, I'll, I'll read it out. You will appreciate that the suggestion yeah. that the government of the time allowed or instigated such an horrendous act of terrorism in such a cynical manner for political expediency is difficult to accept. You clearly believe that the research would lead a rational person to this conclusion. Let's read that again. You clearly believe that the research would lead a rational person to this conclusion. I agree yeah. with that. And I am sorry that I must disappoint you as I do not arrive at that conclusion myself. Does that mean he's not a rational person, Nick? Poor. Well, as you say, uh, he's, just, um, he's just waving it aside uh, and, and, and uh, uh, that, that such a thing cannot happen in his world. Uh, and so he cannot doubt that there really is this Islamic terror menace mm -hmm. in our society. Um, I'll briefly read part of the constituent's reply to that. All right. He says, I am a rational person who has looked at all the evidence regarding this atrocity and have come to the conclusion and have stated the fact on my blog. Mm -hmm. So and then he goes on to, to cite all of the evidence. Um, this one was interesting from uh, the Right Honourable Paul Burstow. Uh, uh, hang on, if I could just comment on, okay. no, on Nick Clegg. Sure. Uh, for, for political expediency, um, this that's rather uh, 
d d dismissive claim. It, it, it was done as part of the uh, the wall program. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, war against terror means continual invasion of Islamic nations, as was blue, uh, expressed in the project in the American century, which is now being carried out. And we now got to Syria. Syria is the next one being destroyed, and the last one, the last is Iran. There's a whole list blueprinted at the end of the last century, and for that to work, people have to feel that uh, we've got some legitimacy for invading Islamic nations, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, that is why these, uh, what Nick Clegg calls horrendous acts of terrorism, um, is, is, is done, uh, and um, the government, the government aren't instigated such an uh, event well it's not just the government it, it's it's kind of axis what I call the axis of evil of, uh, of British and American intelligence mm -hmm. with some Israeli input that is doing this it's masterminding it um, and it's called the New World Order right all right Nick um, now I just want to bring your attention to the um, this email that I got from a constituent of Chris Heaton Harris MP for Daventry now he says that uh, Chris, that's the MP, was thumbing through Terror on the Tube, that's your book, whilst I was talking. He said he would read the book and look at the DVD. Uh, having noticed that David Davis, David Davis was mentioned near the front of the book, uh, right. he mentioned that he is a friend of David Davis right. and that David is um, scathing about the security state that we are turning into. Right. David has hundreds of thousands of people that contact him with different theories about different things. And Chris was sure that David will have heard about 7-7 being an inside job. Yeah. Um, and he will get David Davis's take on this. Wonderful, yeah. So do you know anything about David Davis's oh, yeah, take yeah. on this? Uh, well, so he, does he, he think 7-7's seven an inside well, job? Well, he, he, he has called for an impartial inquiry on, on the subject. Which is which as far as, the, you would say that's as far as MPs can go then? Yeah, yeah, but also he's, he's expressed great doubts about 9-11 uh, and that w we shouldn't necessarily believe the American narrative on 9-11 uh, and uh, I think that's very, that was some years ago, I think he keeps his head down now on the subject. D didn't he go for conservative leadership at one point against Cameron initially? Was he not one of the other uh, candidates? Uh, 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 he might have done. David yeah, Davis? Yes. Yes, you might have done. But before that, he was calling for um, uh, doubt about this Al Qaeda mm -hmm. um, war like, concept. Like um, the Labour MP like um, Robin, Robin uh, Cook. Yeah. Robin Cook, who did uh, um, one week before he was bumped off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And did you have we mentioned Oliver Letwin? Because he's a fairly high-profile MP, or he was. Um, you thought that was reasonably positive, did you not? Uh, Oliver Letwin, let's have a look. Um. It says, thank you for your letter dated the 19th of October, which I received on the 5th of November. I am making some further inquiries on this and shall write to you again shortly. Yeah. So he's accepted the information and he says he's going to try and now find out yeah, more. Yeah, I would say if there's any possibility of the uh, following that up with an actual visit, um, it could be very worthwhile, uh, the, the surgery which the MP has to meet face to face. Okay. All right, then, Nick. Now, um, you and I, or I was contacted, uh, well, I'll not say when, by somebody who, all I'm going to say is, seemed to have one foot in each of these camps. In other words, the um, Islamic section and the government section. Mm -hmm. And this person knew a lot of information about certain aspects surrounding the London bombings, far more yeah. than any person would unless they had inside information. Mm. Uh, Nick and I met with this person and we did glean some further information um, from this person. Now we can't really disclose everything that was discussed because it might compromise this person. Is that true to say Nick? Um, but w let's just touch on a couple of things that we now think are uh, coming together oh, yeah. in, in with regards the recruitment of the four patsies. We've, we've discovered that Jermaine Lindsay was living in Huddersfield above the Ecro Learning Center. Yeah, okay, th so th just, th that seems just tell us the significance of the fact that Jermaine Lindsay was living in Huddersfield and was attending or living in the Ecro Learning Center. Yeah, so we're told Jermaine Lindsay was in Aylesbury at the time uh, of this event, which doesn't have a lot of connection with, with Leeds, you see. So, so it's always been left rather mysterious what connection you had with other lads. And uh, the ICRA Learning Bookshop, which was 
uh, attacked with a battering ram by, by the police when they wanted to, um, they, they totally trashed the place in fact, um, and that is near uh, where Hasib Hussain lives, one, one of the four um, in, in, in B Beeston. And um, some of the alleged bombers worked there in round about 2000. Yeah, yeah, they had a whole sort of gym type thing there uh, and, and some work there, yeah. And, and there's another Ikra bookshop in Huddersfield which was linked uh, and a uh, common ownership. Was set up by the same people. Yeah, set up by the same people. Now, if Jermaine Lindsay was, was working or sleeping just ab ab above that, mm -hmm. that's a very important connection. In fact, it's probably the connection. Yeah. And you recently had another person write to you quite independently, who recalls Jermaine Lindsay as living in Huddersfield. Yeah, and working in a pub in, in Huddersfield. Yeah. Okay. So that, that uh, validates the story which this fella told us. Right. So, yeah. so the thing that links the fourth alleged bomber to the other three <laughs> is the Ikra Learning Centres, or the Ikra Bookshops, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and there are two or three key people who were involved in setting up and managing both those establishments yeah. and we believe that there's one person who was involved in both of them who is probably the person who recruited these patsies to take part in this drill mm. uh, I don't want to name him um, he has been named in national press and, and on, um, my, on my blog uh, right. I um, but we suspect that this person is a key key person to the whole thing and that mm. that's uh, again uh, he gets promoted after the event yes uh, that, that's a key thing to look out for uh, if, if someone gets a good income and promotion after the event yeah. uh, that they get so sort of locked into uh, yeah. a, a, a role where they accept the yeah. state's marriage. He's an Islamic person and he was getting employment from Scotland Yard at one point I believe Nick in counter-terrorism courses? Uh, courses how to fight terrorism yeah, yeah. okay we have done a little bit of digging recently on 77 and we've been trying to find various people who have never spoken on, on this and one of them is, just tell us who it is, it's the mother of uh, the, the wife. Patel, uh, is the mother of Hasina Patel, the, the widow of Khan. Yeah, so uh, Khan was the alleged lead hmm. uh, bomber yeah. uh, who we believe didn't even go to London, yeah. uh, his wife's no, no. mother. Yeah, and this mother was a very distinguished filler, filler, uh, a member of the Beeston community. She was, went to Buckingham Palace to see the Queen uh, for honours, and she was on an interfaith group. She was consulted by the police when they had trouble do with any religious clashes or strife. Uh, and uh, so uh, sh she was quite an important member of the community, and uh, a few years ago, well, around the inquest, she, she was interviewed and saying she'd be happy to talk or give her story. Uh, and and uh, some people from the uh, 9 11 Truth Group did go up and see her in that house, which we went to um, a few months ago. And when we went there, uh, it was deserted, uh, and nobody was living there, uh, and nobody knew where she'd moved to, and we couldn't find any other address. So I, I, I reckon she she has passed away. Right. Uh, and. Uh, she didn't look to me like she was about to, uh, d uh, uh, you know. And her daughter, the wife of Khan, actually asked to give evidence at the inquest. Yes. Just tell us about y that. Yeah, uh, she would be, I always feel that would be the ace of spades if anyone could get her, 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 her story, uh, Hasina Patel. Uh, Just to interrupt. She has yep, remarried, so taken the veil, changed her name, lives in Sheffield, so it's quite difficult for anyone to contact her now. But on the 6th of July, the day before the bombings, she was in labour, she was having labour pains, looked like she was going to give birth, and we suspect that Khan, that's the reason why Khan cancelled, he didn't go to London, yeah. uh, and uh, she would know all this. She would know yeah. when she's last seen him, yeah. and we, well, she hasn't had a proper chance to explain her story. She did that no, Sky, no. Sky interview, which it looked to me like she had her hands tied behind her back in that interview. One on the interview she's done, yeah. Yeah, she's done one interview. I think it was the fifth. She, she went into labour because I had a really good talk with Arshad Patel, her son, um, and uh, she went into labour and then she had a miscarriage on the morning of the 7th, a very mm. remarkable synchrony there, mm. which has never been properly discussed or commented right. on, uh, and I think she was frantically trying to ring Khan. Mm -hmm. on the 6th, or even the 5th on the 6th, right. and couldn't get through to him. Farida Patel is the mother, H uh, Hasina Patel, that, that was but she daughter. has a new married name now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If, if, if anyone uh, can help us 
contact her to get an interview with her. That would be that would be very helpful because you know we 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 want to know what the dialogue was with Khan before the events took place, and she will know. Well, a whole lot of fabricated stories about Khan. Uh, sh she'd be able to uh, tell people what's what. Mm -hmm. um, but she was held in police custody for quite a while. Yes, she was. She, she was held in Paddington Green police custody uh, on... Uh, uh, she wasn't quite sure what the charge was supposed to be. But, um, okay, then, Nick. Now, by the time this interview goes out, I will have recontacted some of these constituents to get them to write to their MPs again, mm -hmm. the ones that are uh, sympathetic to the information, mm -hmm. with the intention of trying to create some sort of renegade group of MPs. And as I say, by the time this airs, this will have all been done. Mm -hmm. All right. So, what do you think the best tack is to actually do that? What, what do you think we should be saying to these MPs that seem to be sympathetic? Well, one thing I would like to do is get all British MPs to watch a film, a film about 9/11, which I think they could handle better. Okay, and less emotionally shattering. And it's a brilliant new uh, Italian film. It's called 9 11 The New Pearl Harbor. And it is five hours long, yes, but it's a very detailed and rational and educational step by step. It starts off with Pearl Harbor's fabricated event, making analogies with 9 11. Mm -hmm. It goes very carefully through each step of the process. Uh, and, and it's been uh, basically it's the best film that's yet, yet been made about 9 11. And uh, I would like to see a campaign for. British MPs to be um, asked to watch it. Okay, and I would add to that and read Dr. Judy Wood's book because it's the only Judy scientific yeah. study sure, of the yeah. evidence. Sure, yeah. I don't know whether this film mentions her work, but um, I hope it does. Hmm. If you're plugging it on my show, <laughs> um, but yeah, I would I would recommend MPs read that book, and um, I know that a few of them have been told about it. Because hmm. um, uh, uh, any. Any analysis of the London bombings, the best possible way to start is to look at what happened on 9-11. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we need a new generation of politicians growing up uh, who, who are conversant with the concept of state terror, fabricated terror, uh, made to precipitate war. It's been going on right through the 20th century, for goodness sake. And it's taught in school history lessons now, okay? Kids get Gulf of Tonkin, the fact that nothing happened there to start the, the Vietnam War started out of nothing. Kids get taught that in history. Yeah, but they now. get taught that Osama bin Laden did 9-11 though, don't they? Well, OK, but I'm saying it's a start. Uh, yeah. start really. All right, then, Nick. Well, thanks again for joining us, mm. and um, good luck with your endeavours. And it just remains for me to say, I believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.